Okay, there we go. Well, welcome back, folks. Uh, boy, Christmas is almost here. I can't believe it. I've done one bit of Christmas shopping yet. So far, I'm just, uh, you know, totally out of the Christmas spirit as far as shopping. So anyway, we're going to talk today about one man and his family. Uh, you know, every community seems to have those movers and shakers, those guys that just have a lot to do with how the community uh, arises and, and becomes what it is. I don't think you can probably find anybody that had any more to do with the uh, movement of Springfield up into a city as opposed to a town than Colonel John O'Day. Of course, the Colonel is one of those uh, titles that were given honor honorably instead of really, he wasn't really a Colonel, just given that title. He was a young man. This is him, very good looking young man, as you can see. Uh, he came in uh, from New York. He is often referred to as Springfield's first millionaire. Uh, he was born in Limerick, Ireland in 1844. Quite the place. I always thought that would be a lovely place to be from, Limerick, Ireland. Uh, as a child, he immigrated to America with his parents, eventually became a lawyer, uh, moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and met up with a young lady by the name of Sarah Jane Jenny Campbell. And they moved to Springfield about the year the Civil War ended. Uh, I'm not for sure what prompted them to move to, to Springfield. I've often wondered if uh, Sarah Jane was kin to the Campbells, who actually are the founders of Springfield. Uh, I, you know, I, I've not been able to figure that out. I've not got any evidence that that was the case. But uh, it always made me wonder if maybe perhaps uh, she was related to the original Campbell family, John Polk Campbell, that actually is considered to be the founder of Springfield. They had two children, John and Alexander. And uh, he and his two brothers, who also moved to Springfield, Thomas K. and James, all became successful lawyers. Just so happened that when the Frisco Railroad came to town, he was appointed the corporate lawyer for the Frisco Railroad. Eventually, he worked his way up to president uh, by 1890, and so became just a super wealthy person for, for Springfield. And I uh, had a whole lot to do with the railroad uh, being what it was. This is a picture of Sarah Jane Campbell. This was his first wife. He had three, as you'll find out. Um, this was their house. They lived over on uh, St. Louis Street. St. Louis Street, if you're familiar at all with Springfield, you know that St. Louis Street today is just, it's a business street. Uh, when Route 66 came in, and that was part of Route 66, uh, they tore down just tons of old houses. This used to be the, the millionaire's row of Springfield back in the uh, turn of the century. And I mean, there were just beautiful houses lining up and down St. Louis Street. And this is just one of them. Uh, if you wonder where that house was, if you're familiar with Springfield, you might know where the Shrine Mosque is. Well, this house would have been built almost right next to what is now the Shrine Mosque. Uh, which also was the site of a beautiful home. Uh, so, you know, he you can tell the man had money. Uh, I would, Man, I can't even imagine living in that house. I've always wanted as a young man and even as a middle-aged man to have lived in a Queen Anne Victorian home. I mean, beautiful home. So he became a very powerful person, very influential in the Democratic Party, was actually the uh, leader of the Democratic Party in the state of Missouri, was making tons of money. Everything was going great, except his personal life began to deteriorate. You know, how many times have we seen this? And sure enough, old John uh, found him another woman. In the 1880s, his 23-year marriage to Jenny Campbell ended in divorce. And even though he was a committed Catholic, somehow he was able to get through all that and uh, ended up divorcing his wife. Within a couple of years, he married a young lady by the name of Clementia Alice Underwood Vale. 
Uh, she had been married before. I think her maiden name was Underwood. Uh, and she had been married before to a man by the name of Vale. So anyway, they got married. Now, the problem was Clementia, uh, she wanted to live in a fashion appropriate to being a millionaire's wife. <laughs> you know, John was the wealthiest man in Springfield. And she uh, probably must have had visions of the Vanderbilts and the Carnegies and the Rockefellers. I don't know if you've ever been to some of these big houses back east, like in Newport, uh, where they built their summer cottages. Uh, you know, she had visions that she wanted to build a cottage in the southwestern part out away from the city. She didn't want to be, you know, she wanted to be away from the city and live in the country in a country cottage. So she persuaded John to build her a manor house. And boy, was it something else. Uh, this is a, the only picture I've ever been able to find of Clementia Alice today. She lived in 1939, eventually died in Florida. Um, and apparently she became kind of a recluse in the latter part of her life. Uh, she was apparently a real society uh, maiden for a long time, but then she became kind of a recluse. So I don't know. She must have been a beautiful woman in her younger years because uh, she definitely attracted John's attention. So anyway, by 1892, John O'Day had started construction on a Victorian mansion on a 200-acre site southwest of Springfield, out of the city, and ended up being a 34 five room mansion built of limestone that was quarried on the site uh he imported stonemasons from europe to come over and build the thing he spared no expense uh the mansion was three stories tall with a four-story tower on one corner of the house all the woodwork was uh carved out of walnut trees on the property and, you know, back in these days, they just spent a lot of time on the woodwork in these houses. And I'm sure he had uh, woodworkers imported in from a foreign country, too, probably England or somewhere. Uh, Plaminia went shopping in Europe and found as many antiques and pieces of, of art that she could find. She even found one in France that was called the Dolphin Fireplace. So this was the mansion. It still stands in Springfield. Springfield has a history of tearing down everything they can tear down of historical value. I hate to say that, but they've, they've not been very good about uh, preserving their historical past. This one still stands. This is the Effendale Mansion that sits basically at the corner of Sunshine and Kansas Avenue, if, you know, if you're familiar with Springfield. It's hard to see now because there's shopping centers lining Sunshine Street and it's kind of difficult to see, but you can definitely still drive up to the mansion. It's still an operating bed and breakfast. Uh, a lot of weddings take place there, but he built this house for her. And I mean, it is a gorgeous home to say the least. Here's a more modern view of the house. You can see uh, the, tor the turret there. And uh, I'm not for sure. I can't remember how to pronounce his name. It's a French term for it, basically portisserie or something like that. Uh, where they would bring their carriages in and you would unload the carriage and walk up into the house so you wouldn't get wet. You notice that uh, they have curved windows, which were very expensive to make. I've got a little story to tell you about that later. Um, this is the back side of the house again, or pardon me, the east side of the house. So you can kind of see, you know, what it looked like. I also have some pictures of the inside. Like I said, it's been it's it's been redone, and it's a it's a working bed and breakfast today. This is the dolphin fireplace that she uh, retrieved from France out of some French chateau. Uh, one of the bedrooms. These pictures are a little old, so I imagine they've updated them since then. You can tell by the uh, TV. <laughs> yeah, obviously they're. Uh, it's old. This is I like this picture because it shows you some of the intricate woodwork carving in the house. And you can see that they must have just spent tons of money on getting these uh, carvings done correctly. Here's some of the leaded glass windows at the front of the house. Beautiful home. 
just absolutely gorgeous. This is a huge four-story limestone barn that Clementia had built on the property. Uh, now, it's a barn, but it's more than a barn. You can't see it, but you'll notice there is a fourth floor up here, or, or pardon me, a third floor. There's a basement in there, and there's a floor here and a floor here, and then this is the upper floor. That floor had hardwood floors and stained glass windows, and it was designed to have her parties. She wanted to have big parties at her mansion. And so they designed the barn to be a working barn, but at the same time have this gigantic, uh, you know, dance floor built. So as you can see, she spent a lot of money. Here's a picture of one of the curved glass windows. Uh, told you I had a story to tell. Uh, as I was working all my years in education, I developed a friendship with a fellow teacher uh, who was a direct descendant of John O'Day. His uh, name was Thomas O'Day Smith. And uh, Tom grew up in Springfield. Uh, he, I don't believe he inherited much of the fortune, to say the least. I'm not sure there was a fortune by the time uh, Clementia got done with it. But anyway, uh, he said he can remember going with his mother out to the mansion, because at that time it was owned by the Sisters of Visitation and uh, uh, a Catholic word. And they would, uh, thinking they had all tons of money, would say, you know, we need a window replaced. And he said these windows were just like hundreds of dollars back when he was a kid in the early 50s. Uh, no telling what they would be now. But, uh, you know, uh, it was one of those kind of situations that he grew up. Uh, I used to laugh every time we'd drive by this, going somewhere. He and I were just very, very good friends. Uh, he would look over at that and he'd say, hmm. Should have been mine. <laughs> I ought to be living there. But uh, and he would laugh about it. Yeah. Uh, another picture of the inside of the mansion. So she wasn't just satisfied with having a nice mansion and having a big luxurious barn for dances. She also wanted to make sure that the uh, grounds were complete. And so she dammed up Fast Night Creek, which ran through the property and made a lake and had an island built in the middle of the lake and then she had a big uh footbridge that would cross over to the island and had a a japanese pagoda built uh back in these days there was a lot of interest in the in the japanese culture and so she had a pagoda built so they could go out and have their evenings out on the uh lake uh under her pagoda uh she had formal gardens built like the english do uh Exotic animals roam the place, peacocks, llamas, all sorts of animals. So as you can see, she even had a large greenhouse built to build her big exotic plants. So as you can see, Clementia really wanted this to be a show place. She wanted this to be a millionaire's mansion. The only problem was uh, John began to run out of money. Uh, by the way, uh, the name came, uh, she called the place Elfendale. And the reason she said that as she would look out her tower window out across the mist of the lake, she could imagine that she would see elves dancing in the dale. And so she named it Elfendale. She must have had a great imagination, to say the least. So anyway, uh, here's a postcard uh, back from the turn of the century. You can see the ground, the mansion in the background, and here's the footbridge over to the island. You can't see the pagoda, but you can see all the landscape. The place was just beautifully landscaped all throughout. Uh, here's some of the formal gardens that still kind of maintain that picture is not very good, uh, but you can see it was uh, still some of the formal gardens there. I think that was from postcard also. Well, unfortunately, John got a little frustrated. John was the first millionaire of Springfield, but apparently John didn't have that much money. And uh, as she was spending money right and left, John was becoming frustrated. And on top of that, he had a wandering eye. And so he met with another young lady. And uh, as it happened in 1900, Colonel O'Day started divorce proceedings against Chlamydia. Uh, 
This took place in St. Louis. Uh, and while they were there, Clementia came to St. Louis to represent her, her lawyers represent her in the uh, divorce. And the story goes, it's in the newspapers, you can still read the newspapers, that she apparently, when she saw that the divorce was not going to go her way, uh, she was wanting a lot more than what she was going to get. Uh, she tried to kill herself. Well, she, she attempted suicide. Let's put it that way. Uh, she shot herself in the chest, but apparently um, it wasn't too serious because O'Day stayed with her through the convalescence. She did recover, uh, but that didn't pull the trick. I don't know if this was an attempt to get his sympathy back or whatever. It didn't work. The divorce went through. And when they interviewed her in the Springfield newspapers, asking her why she tried to shoot herself, she said that O'Day was planning on throwing her out into the world penniless. Well, I don't think she went out into the world penniless. When it was all over with, he gave her Elfendale, her mansion. He gave her a hotel in downtown Springfield, which was probably the best hotel in Springfield at that time, the Metropolitan Hotel, right down by the square. Um, he also gave her a couple hundred thousand dollars in Frisco stock. So as it turned out, uh, she didn't get cast out into the world penniless. So anyway, the divorce went through. Here's the Metropolitan Hotel. It was right down off the square, uh, kind of was across the street on College Street from the current HERS building. And it was uh, built in the French style. You can see the iron cast iron balconies and uh, all the different, all the, uh, you know, intricate work. It was supposedly the best hotel in Springfield, the most beautiful hotel of the time. Well, John, unfortunately, was kind of broken by all this. Uh, first of all, he was already in poor health. He was fighting terminal uh, kidney disease. He also had developed over the years a very excessive drinking problem. And because of all the notoriety, his, his scandalous lifestyle became out into the public because of the divorce. They removed him as president of the Frisco Railroad. Still had money, but you know he had basically lost a lot of his money. He had lost his power. He had lost his prestige. Well, that didn't keep him from his wandering eye because shortly after his divorce, he married a young lady by the name of Susan Baldwin. Now, I've seen it spelled both ways, Baldwin, B-A-L-D-E-N, and B-A-L-D-W-I-N. Uh, she was one of his private secretaries. She also had two young children, uh, John and Catherine, who had been fathered by John's brother, James. Go figure, okay? I don't know if they were married. I don't know if they weren't. But nevertheless, he adopted these two children. And right after his death, uh, he lived long enough to conceive another child, Thomas K. O'Day, who was named after another of John's brothers who had died earlier. So if that wasn't enough, uh, Miss Baldwin decided that she wanted Effendale and the Metropolitan. So she sued Clementia O'Day in court for possession of the mansion, of the hotel, et cetera. Because I'm not for sure that when John died, he had all that much money left. Uh, I think he'd pre pretty much spent it all. So they had a big trial, O'Day versus O'Day. Uh, again, you can read the court transcript on, on the internet. It's there. And uh, it was quite the transcript. And uh, Oh, it was just full of uh, accusations and innuendos. And as it turned out, uh, uh, Miss Baldwin lost. Plaminia clearly had possession of the property. Uh, you know, the judge ruled that uh, John O'Day had it absolutely intended for his former wife to have that property and the money and all. So, you know, she lost. I really don't know what happened to Miss Baldwin after that. Uh, this is Susan Baldwin Baldwin. Uh, I'm not for sure when they went. Very a uh, woman. I think she was only like in her early 20s when John married her, and he was already in his 50s and died. You know. 
Uh, this is his vault. If you were to go to uh, Hazelwood Cemetery in Springfield, this is his vault where he and some of the other members of his family uh, are interred. So what happened to Effendale? You might ask yourself, after all this uh, wild going on, what happened? Well, folks, I got news for you. It didn't get any simpler. Effendale has this really wild history in Springfield. 1905, Clementia was just about destitute. Now, it's hard to believe that in the five years after she was divorced, receiving all this money, $200,000 in stock, and folks, that, that's a fortune. In today's term, I mean, I don't know how many millions of dollars that would be in today's dollars, but it was a lot. But she absolutely had spent almost all of it. She was destitute. So she was offered $250,000 by some people to buy the mansion, but she could not bring herself to leave it. Uh, she had kind of become a recluse. Uh, she just no longer wanted to uh, be out in the public because of all the notoriety of her divorce and her attempted suicide in the suit from uh, that had occurred uh, from his third wife. So being a devout Catholic herself, she opted to transfer the mansion and the ground to a Catholic order of the Sisters of Visitation. And she said, all I want is $30,000 and the right to live on the property for the rest of her life. She said, basically, if you will just let me live here for the rest of my life, uh, you know, there's ways you can do that. And uh, they agreed to that. And so the Sisters of Visitation took over Effendale. She still lived in the mansion. Uh, I understand from reading and all that she apparently didn't leave the grounds very often. In fact, I've read reports that she only left it twice in her life after after she turned it over to uh, the sister of visitation. I don't know if that's true or not. And I've got here that she died in 1935. I've just recently found her death certificate. She actually died in 1939 in Florida. Um, so anyway, uh, she apparently lived there for the most of the rest of her life. Now, what did the sisters do with the mansion? Well, they decided they were going to convert it over into a private girls boarding school. And so by 1906, they had converted it into the Chantel Academy of the Visitation uh, for all these young Catholic uh, schoolgirls that would come. And they actually lived there. I'll show you the dormitory they built. It was a boarding school, which was quite the thing back in those days for the rich population. They sent their children away so they didn't even be bothered by them. Uh, and it operated clear up into the 60s. Uh, Got to tell you a personal little story. I can remember as a teenager, we were fascinated with this place. Uh, I mean, we would drive by and uh, we would see it and here would be these Catholic school girls out in the lawn. And we were just, it just, you know, triggered all sorts of imaginations. Um, and I can remember driving by these gates as a young kid with my friends and they'd be out there. And I can remember one of them hollering one time, I need to escape. Please come get me. You know, and I mean, they were just having fun with us, you know, just like we were having fun with them. It, it was a, it was one of those kind of places that just triggered imagination. Well, anyway, over the next few years, the sisters made improvements on the property. They added a dormitory. They built a chapel as well as several other outbuildings. Uh, by 1906, as I said, it opened the doors to the St. Deschatel Academy. Uh, and it remained in operation until 1964, when finally the place closed down because they just could not afford to maintain it. The order was a very small order. There was a lot less interest in the schools at that time. Uh, and the result was by the 1970s, they had sold the uh, the uh, mansion and the grounds to a group of Iranian investors. Now, here's the story. I told you it got wild, okay? Uh, here's the story about this. If you remember what was going on in Iran in the late 70s, there was a revolution going on in Iran. And the people that run Iran today, uh, the Muslim, it's a Muslim a fundamentalist country, uh, they were trying to depose the Shah of Iran. The Shah of Iran was a big friend of the United States. 
And so he had his investors over in America looking for a place for him to live. And for whatever reason, they found Effendale. And so these investors bought Effendale with the intent, knowing that the Shaw was probably going to have to be deposed. They, they, you know, he did this knowing that he was probably not going to make it. Uh, and the idea was for the Shaw and his entourage and his family to move to Springfield and to live at Effendale. Unfortunately for the Shaw, he developed, I believe, cancer and ended up going instead of Effendale. He went to the hospital in New York City when he was deposed and didn't last very long. He ended up dying. Um, so never made it. So now what happens to Effendale? Well, it gets wilder. In the mid 70s, man by the name of Larry Flint. I bet some of you out there maybe have heard of Larry Flint. Larry Flint was probably uh, the biggest pornographer in American history. Uh, he published a magazine by the name of Hustler. And he had gotten in trouble with uh, suing uh, Jerry Falwell. Or pardon me, he got in trouble with Jerry Falwell, who was a member of a big fundamentalist Baptist church. And he had made up some stories about Jerry Falwell and Jerry Falwell suiting. And uh, Jerry Falwell ended up winning initially, but it went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And when it got there, Larry Flint was just, uh, I don't know how to describe him. He was weird, okay? Uh, he had been shot. He was in a wheelchair. He was a... Uh, he was basically uh, handicapped from the waist down. He couldn't move. He shows up for court in a diaper made out of the American flag, and he just causing all sorts of trouble. And finally, the judge said, I've had enough of you. You must be crazy. I'm sending you, I'm charging you with contempt of court, and we're sending you somewhere to see, have you analyzed, to see if you really are crazy or just acting out. So he ended up at the Springfield Federal Medical Center in Springfield. When he got here, he found out that that was where, Jer where Jerry Falwell had gone to college, BBC. Well, all of a sudden, he starts making up ideas. He thinks, I'm going to take my whole operation and bring it to Springfield. I'm going to make Springfield the pornographic capital of America. And I don't think he really intended on doing that. But, you know, that was his announcement. His old entourage showed up and they started looking for a place for him to live. They decided they were going to buy Effendale from the Iranian investors. Well, thank the good Lord, that fell through. Okay. Uh, he didn't stay at the Federal Medical Center very long. And, you know, obviously he had no intent to stay in the Ozarks. He was a big city boy. He was, you know, he would have fit in about like me fitting in Los Angeles. And so he decides that he's going to go back. And so that fell through. So then what happened to Effendale? Well, this time a non-denominational church came in and brought the mansion in the grounds. Uh, I don't know if they decided maybe they were going to protect it or what after Larry Flynn's episode. So anyway, uh, the Cornerstone Church was built there. Uh, the result was they built a new sanctuary. They still operate their church there. They end up turning the mansion into a bed and breakfast. The adjoining chapel has become a wedding venue and people, that, I mean, people get constantly married at Effendale today and use it for their honeymoons and all. It's a it's a big deal in Springfield. Uh, I don't really know what the connection between Effendale and the Cornerstone Church is anymore. I just know that there was a connection there for some time. This is the dormitory that still stands on the grounds um, that they built, the Sisters Visitation built. Uh, this is the Shah of Iran. His family or investors owned it for a little bit. And this is old Larry Flint in his gold-plated wheelchair. That shows you what kind of character he was. Uh, and this was the preacher uh, of the Cornerstone Baptist Church for decades, uh, Jess Gibson, until he just recently passed away, I think, actually last year. Um, so, you know, that's the people who have owned it since the 70s. Uh, quite a history. 
This is the small chapel that still sits on the grounds that's used primarily for the weddings that occur there. So that is the story of that is the story of Effendale. I finished this a lot earlier than I intended to. I don't know. It took me a whole hour to talk about this the other day when I did my in-person presentation here at the township. So I don't know why I went through it so fast. Um, but it's a it's quite an interesting uh, place. Uh, it's a beautiful place. You can still see it. You can still tour it. Uh, it's one of those places that has not been torn down uh, by the fathers of Springfield. Like I said, Springfield has a history of just tearing down tons of things. The railroad depot down at Main and Mill, that was just absolutely beautiful. And I cannot imagine what that would be today if, uh, if they had not torn it down in the 70s. Uh, there's just been, uh, like I said, when Route 66 came through, they tore down just mansion after mansion after mansion along St. Louis. Uh, John Q. Hammonds tore down a bunch of them, built the University Plaza. Uh, the uh, John Woodruff turned uh, tore some down to build uh, the Kentwood Arms Hotel in the twenties. Uh, they just, I mean, they were beautiful mansions. I've got pictures of several of them, and I mean, they're just it was just absolutely good, almost like a looked like something out of a big city, and uh, they were beautiful houses. But uh, that's the story of Effendale, the story of John O'Day. He is one of the most fascinating characters in Springfield's history. But he's also very responsible for the growth of Springfield. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, in the coming weeks for a little bit. We're going to talk about the growth of Springfield between 1870 and uh, about 1930, uh, the, the period of time when Springfield grew up. Uh, in 1870, Springfield only had about 5,000 people. By 1930 census, it had almost 60,000 people. That's a that's a remarkable growth in population by any standard, you know, to to uh, go almost 10 times, uh, over 10 times in a very short number of years. And so that's what we're going to talk about. And we're going to talk about the uh, mining industry that was centered in Joplin. Uh, talk about that. Talk about the timber industry. And then we're going to talk for a couple of uh, sessions of what it was like to be a typical Ozarker. You know, so far we've talked about the cities and all like this. We need to talk about what it was to be a typical person living out in the country in the small towns where I grew up. And uh, we're going to couple, take a couple of sessions and talk about what I like to call the everyday life of the Ozarker what it was really like to live in the Ozarks, because most of us never even had any idea of living in Effendale Mansion. Uh, all we could do was drive by it and wave it to schoolgirls. That was our idea, <laughs> you know. So anyway, I appreciate you being with me today. I hope you learned something. And uh, Donna, good to see you there. Yeah, that was a fascinating story. I had never heard that. Neither has art. My goodness, what a... But I have heard of Larry Flynn. <laughs> <laughs> well, most people right don't there. realize the history of yeah, Ethan. It's so. quite, a, quite a place, to say the least. Yeah. It's had a rich history. Let's put it that